All right, Rich Fowley here at Book Expo America, where there's so much action and activity happening, and I'm sitting with one of the cool people that I know, Jody Aww. Picot, <laughs> who you. has a brand new book called Small Great Things. So nice to have you here. Welcome. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, I love all that you do and the world that you live in and the, the, <laughs> the issues you espouse. Your writing is part of that, but there's so much more to what you do in the world of writing, and we're going to talk about all that. Awesome. But let's start first with this, first of all, the cover, wonderful. Sort of a different cover for a Jody Picot book. Yeah, yeah. And also, everyone says your name differently. How do you like to say your name? Pico. That's how I've always said it. Yeah, I so feel see, good. you're yeah. bad a thousand. <laughs> so, Small Great Things is to tackle some really heavy subjects, though. Yes. Yeah. This is a, a big book on race relations in America. Correct. It's about Ruth, who's a nurse at a hospital. There's a Confederate patient, or a person who has a Confederate flag and right. who's a, a, a person who does not want an African-American nurse taking care of his baby. Right. It's a big, weighty subject. Can you right. talk a little bit about what led you to this and, and what, when you got into it, where did you want to go with yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I actually have wanted to write about racism in America for a very long time. I had an abortive attempt about 20 years ago, and it was uh, a topic that has just, I, that I've, I've, I can't shake. And that's usually the, the kind of topic I want to write about. I think racism weighs heavy on a lot of people's hearts in this country. Um, certainly you see it in the news every day. The first time I tried to write about it, I was bringing off a real life story about a, an officer who was undercover in New York City who was shot in the back multiple times by his own colleagues, even though he was wearing um, a band that they call the color of the day, which identifies undercover cops. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't manage to create a, a, a viable African-American character. And I didn't understand why. And I just kept struggling. And eventually, I, I abandoned it. But I still was thinking about it for many, many years. Um, I kept thinking even more about racism in the wake of a lot of the news stories that we've been hearing. And then I read about a story from Flint, Michigan. It was a woman who, as you said, this is the real life story, African-American nurse, delivers a baby, um, is part of the delivery team. The parents are skinheads, don't want anyone who looks like her to take care of that child. And uh, I push the envelope. In real life, they wound up, all the African-American personnel in the hospital banded together, sued the hospital, got a big payout, which is awesome. But I wanted to think about what could have gone wrong. So I have Ruth, this nurse, um, being given a direct order to not touch the infant. When the infant becomes very ill, she has to decide to either save him and obey orders or uh, you save him or obey orders. And as a result of that, she winds up on trial. And her attorney is a white woman who is probably like me and a lot of my fans and a lot of people who look like you and I, who don't think of themselves as racist, but because um, they're not skinheads, but who still are maybe unaware of the privileges that they have. Mm -hmm. And all three narrators in this book, Ruth, the skinhead father, and Kennedy, the, the uh, attorney, all have to face issues of race and power and privilege. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it was a very deeply personal book for me. And I realized the reason that I could actually finally finish this one was because I found the right audience. I was not trying to write a book to tell people of color in this country what their lives are like, because I have no right to do that, and I can't tell them anything they wouldn't already know. But I am writing to the people who look like me, who would never call themselves racist, who would mm -hmm. never say, I'm, I'm prejudiced, you know, who think they're open-minded and um, unbiased, and who haven't really accepted the fact that some of the success that we have had as white people in this country is because people of color have not had it. That is a really hard thing to admit to if you want to believe in the American dream, which is why we prefer to not discuss it at all. Right. So I am hoping that this book gets the people who look like you and I talking about racism because we're a big part of the problem. Right. Well, that, that character of Kennedy, mm -hmm. the attorney, as you mentioned, yeah. is a bridge character that sort of allows you to go right into yeah. that world exactly. and do so comfortably from your perspective at the yeah. same time and not preachy. And well, I really felt yeah. like that was like Thanks. the hard part to do. Cause right. When you're a white person who, whether you recognize privilege or not, when you're a white right. person and you live in this country, yeah. it's hard to go into that world and, and come off legitimately. You can't get rid of your privilege, you know, because racism is systemic and institutional. But you can decide what you do with it. And, um, you know, I, I do believe that this journey for me was such a hard one 
because I really had to strip away this veneer of who I thought I was for who I really am. I went to racial justice workshops. I sat down with women of color who tolerated my absolute ignorance and you know, shared their lives with me. I read tons of books um, from social justice educators and uh, you know, from tons of people of color trying to really understand uh, what I needed to know to educate myself before I could even begin to write this book. But ultimately, the role of the white ally is to talk to your own people, you know? And, and that's really what I hope I can do with Small Great Things. Mm -hmm. I hope I can encourage people to take that first step on a journey if they haven't already. Yeah, why, you know, so, so much happens in this world where you don't necessarily recognize uh, sort of the imperfections of the society we live in until it happens to you directly. It actually, yeah. for whatever reason, that sense of empathy isn't natural for a lot of right. people. You have to sort of, it has to hit you in the face and then you get it. And then um, you can't unsee it. Right. Like, you know, I, I can't converted stop then. seeing it now. Right. Now, that I, now that I know how far we have to go, <laughs> I can't not see it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like that. It isn't a comfortable place to be, but you know what? Comfort is a privilege. Right. And there are a lot of people who spend a lot of their lives being a lot less comfortable than I've been for the past 50 years, you know? So it, everything's relative. And, um, you know, this was a sea change for me. The, the writing of this book changed the way I see myself, the way I see the world, the way I see my relationship to other people in the world. And the most I could, I could really hope for is that the people who read it feel that's a worthy step to take as well in their lives. I mean, some people may not be ready. Some people may jump, dive right in. I'm still a work in progress. We're all works in progress. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still a great story. You know, there are tons of amazing relationships. The characters are in there. The trademark Jody Pico twist is in there. You're going to get a great read. It still feels very much like you. Yeah, but it's still but it also does feel like you, you crossed a bridge to, to yeah. another world. That's I hope like so. yeah, and it's it strikes me as to your point, you can't unsee it. Right. I wonder where will your writing go now that you've sort of crossed that bridge and you've sort of tackled these mm -hmm. new subjects. It's still you brought a lot with you across the bridge. Oh, I think so. I mean, you know, I like to think I take everything that I learn in a book with me, and yeah. I become a better person as a result of writing it. Or why am I doing this career anyway? But I. I think this is such a huge issue in our country. This is such a national dialogue that we're not having. Mm -hmm. We are doing such a, a, a fabulous job of sweeping it under the carpet with all our might that you know it, it's going to erupt unless we actually have an honest conversation. And that's going to be um, it's going to be a conversation that's hard. We're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. That's okay, as long as we recognize that it's more important to talk about it than to not discuss it at all. Yeah. And you know, what I would hope for is that whatever I address next in a novel, you know, I may veer off in a different direction. I may not be touching on race relations in this country, uh, but I would hope that the characters that I'm creating as a result of what I've learned here are real and honest and truthful, that I create a more diverse world in my books, that, um, and that you know, people who read this book put it down and then go find a writer of color who they haven't found yet that they can discover and learn from. Um, that honestly would be like the highest compliment you could give me. Yeah, that, well, I, you're earning it right now. <laughs> but let, let's talk a little bit about sort of the designation of a book like this. Yeah. You've gone through this sort of long road of like what people call your books, you know, and, and now there's, we've sort of settled into this women's fiction world, which strikes me as wrong for this book. We're talking about Thank characters you. who are women. <laughs> But it's about so much more, obviously, yeah. and it's about this world. You're writing from a female perspective, but right. but there's a lot more here, obviously. Yeah. What do you think about that designation? And are you trying to? What can you do to like dictate what people call your work, or do you even try? Oh, I try. <laughs> you know, here's a little secret. When they call you women's fiction, um, what they really mean is you're a woman who writes fiction. Um, you know, I've been called chiclet, for example. And there's nothing wrong with chiclet. Chiclet is a great genre. It's fun to read. It um, has huge amounts of followers. But if you call, for example, a novel like The Storyteller, chiclet, it's the worst chiclet ever. It's about yeah. the Holocaust. Yeah. There is nothing light and fluffy about the Holocaust. Oh, that would be true. There's nothing light and fluffy about racism. You know? So to call this a, a, a women's fiction read is to limit it. Um, I don't understand why we don't call then men's fiction men's fiction. You know, uh, there are plenty of novels by writers who are 
mostly white males who write about family relationships and uh, interpersonal dynamics and are not called women's fiction writers, which are supposed to be the hallmarks of women's fiction. So it really does come down to do you have lady parts or not? And I have been very vocal about this because I think it's an arbitrary designation and um, I think it's completely unfair given that the vast majority of the book buying market happen to be women. Mm -hmm. um, I am really, really proud of the fact that this year I was asked to be on the board of Vita, which has uh, crunched the statistics for uh, gender inequity as well as all, all other kinds of inequity, um, racial and uh, uh, disabilities and uh, sexual orientation in publishing to see who's being reviewed and who's not. And uh, to be part of that group is such an honor for me because I have, I've just been on my own little stump yelling very loud and to have someone recognize that I've been yelling made me feel really, really good. I don't plan to stop yelling anytime soon. Um, what I think is that you should pick up a book and you should read it because you're interested in it, in the topic, in the storytelling, in the, the, uh, the narrative choices that the storyteller makes. I don't think anyone picks up a book only because it is labeled women's fiction, chiclet, commercial fiction, literary fiction. Most of us read across the board. Those yeah. are all very arbitrary designations. Well, we had one of your um, one of your co-conspirators, Jennifer Weiner, here yeah. earlier, and it, and uh, I think she said a lot of the same things. Yeah. It strikes me though, your books are really about um, matters of the heart and about big issues that affect mm -hmm. society today. And right. that I would really like to think men think about that too. Well, I would like to as well. <laughs> Or yeah. else we're pretty lame, but um, <laughs> no. But these issues that that truly, the undercurrent of our world, and yes. that to be honest, so often women are on the front lines of because they've carried that burden for generations, and they're just assumed that that's going to be the role that they play. And even if they're doing other things, they're still there. And for whatever reason, we're like, you fine, you you go take that. That'll be right. your thing. And then it becomes a women's thing. Right. Which Do strikes me. You know me. what I am asked more in any interview than any other question. No. How do you balance it all? How do you balance motherhood and writing? And I know, because I'm friendly with male authors, they are never asked that question. Right. Why? Why in 2016 are we still asking women that question? I don't know, but you're helping to push against that. Yes. And, you know, you realize that like, <laughs> these things do take ridiculous amounts of time sometimes, yeah. and it seems slow and crazy, but there is movement. And it, is, is. it does happen, but it's because of you, and you have power, and that, that's sort of what I wanted to sort of explore next well, is the idea, so nice. of, <laughs> of the idea of using your platform for yes. good. Yeah, no, and I recognizing think that's really important. And, and the coalitions you build with yeah. these other writers who, like, you stand together. But it's really important to, it, there, the thing about having a platform is I am so lucky to have one. I am so privileged to have one. And I've always thought that if I were ever in a position like this where people for whatever reason, sometimes listen to me, oh my gosh. Um, you want to do that, you want to use that for good. You really, really do. So yes, I speak about issues that are important to me. I am very outspoken, I'm very vocal. I, I don't tell people what they want to hear, I tell the truth. Um, that for me has been about gender and equity and publishing, but it also means knowing when to seed your platform. So I often use my platform, as does Jennifer very graciously, I think, to champion women writers who haven't been discovered yet because they need all the help they can get. And I also have become very aware of the fact that, you know, as a white woman writing about racism in this country, I'm going to have people pick up this book that there are, there are black writers who are doing a fabulous job of that that are not going to get the same white readership. Mm -hmm. and. That is um, really unfortunate and why I think if you are lucky enough to have people notice you and you step up to the podium, sometimes what you need to do is say, thanks, and hand the mic to someone else. Right. And you know what I really, really hope for, like I said, is that my voice just makes someone else's more marginalized voice a little more able to be heard. But I think also for you, and you, you talked about it a little bit earlier, it's like laying bare your own sort of uh, recognition that you're going through something yourself, that you're yeah. learning as you go and that you don't know totally. everything. And in fact, being honest about yeah. that experience, because when you do that and people yeah. can feel like they can empathize with it, they can do, there's someone else who doesn't have it all figured right. out, who's learning something. Yeah. I think of like Momistry and some of these other like blogs that are out there yeah. that like uh -huh. they just sort of go there, they said, I was so wrong for so long and I'm figuring right. something out right now and you're gonna come along with me right. while I figure it out. And you know, I mean, I, my readers have trusted me for 25 years to take them all kinds of places they usually don't wanna go, but then wind up wallowing through anyway and learning something from. And 
you know. I'm not sure if they wallow, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe they sprint. I don't know. Leap. They're but, pretty happy um, to be there. Yeah, but you know, it's like it's. I talk about tough things, yeah. and and I I don't shy away from those things, and you know, even when they are something that take a personal toll on you, that doesn't necessarily, I think, mean that's a bad thing. I think you wind up being stronger as a result. And, you know, I'm really happy to say, hey, look what I did. Look at what I, I had to learn before I wrote this book. Um, you know, if I could do it, you could do it. I, I mean, I really do believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your platform is incredible. And the <laughs> fact that you are sort of pulling people along with you and banding together with others that makes that even stronger, the sort of interwoven strength of a bunch of people working together. Yeah. It's really exciting to see. And this book, as powerful as it is, is so very much your style and Thank your you. readers are going to love it. And I think they'll cross that bridge with you. I hope so. I really, really do. Yeah, it's and the release be a date, I forget. You can release date is October 11th. Okay, October believe, 11th. Yeah. So you have to you wait have a look a out, bit, everybody. But it's yep. totally worth the wait. It is. So. It is worth the wait. It's a beautiful book too. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jody Picot. So, so nice, nice to see you. To you. Yep.